Can you hear me, even at the back? Is it clear enough? Yes? Okay, thank you. So I hope you had a very good lunch. And welcome to our workshop today about test-driven development and pair programming. Oh, so my code there. Okay, so here's the Wi-Fi code. We're going to need it. So please connect to this one. And if you haven't given your GitHub uh, username, please do so now uh, at the desk over there. We need it to add you to a GitHub uh, repository to be able to push later on. Uh, some logistics. So there will be there is some snacks over there and some drinks. So if you're hungry or thirsty, please help yourself. Um, on your table, there is some goodies from Palo IT. So you have a notepad, you have a pen and metallic straws. So this is for you. And we're gonna take we're gonna be taking some photos today. Uh, so if you don't like uh, to be taken in pictures, please reach out to Chris, or is Chris over there, that you don't want picture taken from you. Um, that's pretty much it for logistics, so let's start. So welcome, as I said, about TD and pair programming today. So this is going to be an introductory workshop so for beginners. So I hope there is not, all of you are not all experimented into that. If not, if yes, maybe you learn some new things. So today agenda, so we're going to start with a check-in. Then we're going to give an introduction to test-driven development. Uh, we're going to introduce to you a report dashboard. You're going to see why later on. Then set up your machine to be able to do the exercise. And I'm going to do a quick demo of test-driven development. Then it's going to be your turn to do the exercise. So we're going to have maybe 40, 45 minutes of exercise with TDD. Uh, then a small debrief all together. And then we're going to have a small break, about 10 minutes. After the break, we're going to do the same with pair programming. So first introduction, then a small demo. And uh, then you're going to do the exercise for about one hour. Then I'm going to debrief, and we're going to conclude with some resources. Uh, today, with me, so my name is Kevin. I'm tech lead at Palo IT. I have Ken, so agile coach at Palo IT. Amul, uh, full stack developer, engineer. Vidaba, DevOps and cloud engineer. Uh, El Nathan over there, full stack engineer, and where is Anil at the reception desk, uh, full stack engineer as well at Palo IT. So Palo IT, I don't know how many of you heard about this company. We are a consulting company, international. Uh, we do development. Uh, we have UI UX, Agile, uh, and DevOps and Cloud. We are about 115 in Singapore. So if you don't know us, just Google it, paloit.sg.com or .com.sg and you find us and you can learn more about us. Check-in. So I invite Kian for the check-in. Do you have a mic? Yeah. So I hope you guys can hear me. It's a bit loud. Right. Let me stand behind you. We do a typical check-in in conferences where we use this thing called Mandimeter. Now what I would like to get within the room is to get a sense of your experience with TNE and your experience with pair programming. So if you can, go to this website, worldwideweb.mandy.com, uh, use the code 399263, and then answer this first question, which is, what is your experience with TMD? That's really fast. Okay. This is not fastest single first, but uh, yes, please contribute to this. Pick up to match against what you know. 
right? To see if there's any gap. Perhaps there's some stuff that you actually know more than what they've shared. That's because they're doing on a very introductory level. That's okay. Try to pick up as much as you can. Um, 24% we have done for less than a year. Good for you. I will encourage you to continue to do more. So the next time we do a check, it will be more than a year. And uh, for the 6%, I'm just going to skip because it's done long enough. Okay? And for those 6% of none, welcome. Welcome to this enjoyable world of test driven development. It will change your life. Okay, uh, let's go for a second question now. So what has been your experience with pair programming? Thank you, Ken. So, test-driven development, what it is. So, it comes from extreme uh, programming, which comes from Agile. So, some of you know Scrum, I bet. So, extreme programming is a different branch of it. So, Ken Hauer, from the book Extreme Programming Applied, wrote this quote. Writing tests first keeps entropy from destroying your code. We write tests, then we write just enough code to get a test pass, no more. That is the best way to keep your code clean. So what this means is the idea is really to write a small test, small as possible, and then to write just enough code to make it pass, and so on and so on. And this avoids your code to become a mess. And this gives you a good structure in your code. So as I said, this is the gospel of TDD by Ken Beck. Ken Beck, another author of Extreme Programming. So write a little test that does not pass. Compiling, not compiling, is not passing as well. So that's completely fine. We call this the red state. So the red state, very important. Then we have to make the test pass as quickly as possible, even if we have to write messy code or committing sin. We just have to make it pass. That's it. This is the green state. After that, once it's passed in green, we eliminate the duplication and we rewrite the code to make it nice and clean. This is called the refactoring. And then we repeat these steps over and over until we arrive to a satisfactory result. Again, if you forget what TDD is, remember this. Red, green, refactor. Quit, make it run, red and green. So writing a test that failed, making it pass, it runs. And then making it right. So we refactor the test, uh, the test and the code to make it clean and nice for the developer to look at it. Some people have asked me, OK, what is refactoring? There is a lot of answer to that. So I invite you to look at this website here. It gives a lot of examples about refactoring. A lot of examples is very good with scenarios and when to do what. Just some examples, so very obvious that most of you do it already, is just putting a name on it. So you can extract a function, you can extract a variable, introducing an explaining variable, you can rename a variable, for example, 
you can introduce a parameter object or replacing loop with pipeline. So those are just five, five examples amongst 100 or 1,000 of them. Uh, now I'm going to give the mic to Vidaba over there, so you can just look on this side. Vidaba, all good? So the idea of the dashboard is industry standards, mode of the client or company, they ask for 80% or above of code coverage. The idea here is to show that TDD is quite easy to reach that numbers. If we do the opposite, meaning we write your code and then at the end, oh, I need to write my test, it's going to be very difficult to have clean test and to reach those 80% or you're not going to write the test that needs to be written. So this is just a dashboard to see, okay, it's very easy to integrate in Jenkins and to show your uh, coworker, colleagues, or even management, OK, my code coverage is 100 or 80%. OK, now I'm going to do a demo of what I just explained before. So I hope that some of you know the FizzBuzz exercise. Who knows it? We have three, four, five. OK, so this is a very famous exercise that in interview uh, been asked a lot. So it looks very simple. I'm going to show you how to resolve it in TDD way. So if the input is a multiple of three, you return fizz. If the input is a multiple of five, you return buzz. If it's of three and five, you return fizz buzz. Otherwise, you just return the number that was given as input. Quite simple, right? So. Oh, let me take a chair. I'm going to zoom in, no worries. Uh, so this is the code you're going to check out later for the exercise. So you can see the package.json is quite simple. We just have Babel uh, for transpiling. We have Jest for the code, uh, for the test. And that's pretty much it. That's all we need. You have a folder with example that contain a basic function and its corresponding tests. It's just for you to get the syntax because some people are struggling just to get the syntax of Jest or so whatsoever. So you can just copy and paste from there as a, as a guideline. So coming back to the FizzBuzz exercise. I'm going to first create a FizzBuzz uh, directory and inside this one I'm going to create two files so one for fizzbuzz.js which is going to contain my function and one for my test so by convention I'm going to name it exactly the same .test.js So on the right side here, you will have my code. So 
Let me zoom in. Can everybody read? Is it big enough? At the back? So my function fizzbuzz, gonna take, uh, I'll say input as, as an argument. I'm gonna export Uh, and that should be it. And then I'm going to write my test. So I'm just going to copy and paste from the example to go a bit faster. Oh, here, import. So this is the name I choose to give to my import. So fizz buzz. And that's pretty much it. Oops, sorry. Okay. Let me move that to the left. Okay. It's difficult to go that big. Okay. So I'm going to describe my test suite. So, FizzBuzz testing suite. And um, thank you. And I'm going to start by, so, uh, what is it from here? Sorry. Just, whoop, my bad. Here. There's something wrong there. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. <laughs> Been doing too much Java lately. Okay. Uh, so it should should return one when one given as simple. So I expect given one to be one. So this is the simplest step I can think about at the moment. So if I run it, We can see it's failing, so now I'm in the red state. Now the next step is to make it run, so make it green as fast as possible. So I'm going to do return 1. I'm going to make it green as fast as possible, it's green. Now I'm in the refactor, so refactor I think for now it's okay, I don't need to refactor, there is not much code. Now next one, next test. So what is the next test that will fail my code? So show return two when two given. So input two to be two. Okay, I run again. And of course, it will be red, it will fail. So now again, I'm in the red state. So now to make it pass as fast as possible, if two, return two. Sorry, it's an integer. Now it pass. So now I'm fine. Do I need to refactor now? No, I think I'm good so far. So let's continue. So now, next one that we fail, if I continue this way. So now, three. Three should return fees. Again, I'm running my test. It should fail, which it does. And again, if input uh, three, return fees with uppercase. Hopefully it'll pass. So I'm in the green state. So now I can refactor a bit. Okay, I'd prefer to have those brackets because it's nicer. And here I can have else with some brackets. And now I like my refactoring. I run my test to ensure that it still pass. OK, I didn't break anything with my refactor. Now, what's the next test that will fail my code? So, show return 4 when 4 given. 
So I input 4 to be 4. I run my test, and again, I'm in the red state. I hope you had the whole afternoon. I'm going to go to 100 like that. <laughs> so now I'm in the red state. So again, to make it fast, so equal 4, return uh, 4. And now we pass. Okay, now I can say I have a tendency whenever I have a number except 3 to return this number as a string. So I can see there's a repetition. So it makes sense now for me to rewrite my code in a better way. So if it's not 3, basically I need to return the input as a string. I'm going to do it this way. And this I can remove. And this I will remove. Now I'm going to run my test again. And it's green, so my refactoring didn't break anything. Now the next test that will fail my code will be 5. So 5 return buzz. Remember, if it's a multiple of 5, I need to return buzz. So when the input is 5, I expect buzz. So again, if input 5 return buzz with the uppercase. And it passes. Can I refactor something now? Uh, yes, maybe I would like the else here, make it nicer. And maybe the test, I can refactor a bit better. Uh, I would say now, I can see I had the tendency before, when I give a number, I should give this number as a string as output. So I would like to refactor as should return uh, uh, the input number when uh, not multiple of 3 and 5 given. So I have 2 here. I have uh, 4 as well. So now I can delete this one and I can delete this one. And I will still ensure that everything pass. So I said before, refactoring is not only on the code side. It has to be on the test side, otherwise you get a mess very easy. Code is important, but test is as much as important as the code. Now, next one that I can think of to make it my code fail will be 6. So 6 need to return fees, multiple of 3. So input, whoop. So fees. Now I'm going to make it run, it should fail. And here, uh, so input 3 or input equal 6. So now I can see here I have like a if that tend to be lengthy, that will start increasing. So I decide to refactor now. I can see like so a multiple of 3. So if my input modulo 3 equal equals 0, because it makes sense for me now to refactor this part, because I have tests that tells me to do it, I return fees. I ensure that I didn't break anything. OK, it still pass. Now I continue. So next one. That can fail. So multiple of 3, so 9, no, it will not fail. So will be the next one, 10, multiple of 5. So input 10, should return buzz. Again, I make it run, so I'm going to be in the red state. Now I'm going to be in the green state by making it pass as fast as possible. So or input equal 10. And I'm in a green state. Again, same. I can see I have a tendency 
is gonna, I'm going to add more condition in the if uh, clause. So I'm going to refactor that. So 5 equal equal 0. So to ensure that whenever it's a multiple of 5, I return buzz. I'm going to read it again. And here I'm in the green state. So can I refactor something? Uh, maybe in my test, I can see here I have a 6, 3, 5, 10. So here, so I should return fields when multiple of 3 given. And same here, so return buzz when multiple of 5 given. Now I can delete those. And I will run to make it sure I didn't break anything. OK, it's still green. Now, what's the next test I can write to make it fail? Remember, the multiple of 3 and 5 should return fizzbuzz. So, should return fizzbuzz when multiple of, when, I would say, when 15 given. So when I give 15, I need to run fizzbuzz, to return fizzbuzz, sorry. I will run, and I should be in the red state. Now again, if input equal equal 15, return fizzbuzz. OK, uh, now it's green. Now I can refactor. Again, I will use the else because I find nicer. Uh, that's all I can do at the moment. So I run again, and I didn't break anything. Now, next test, uh, that can fail, 30. So, fizz buzz when 30 given. So 30 should be fizz buzz. I'm gonna run my test again. And I'm in the red state. I'm gonna do this, or, Input 30, return fizz buzz. I'm in the red, uh, green state. Now I can refactor. So again, I can see a tendency of repeating is still going to increase the more tests I add. So I'm going to do that. So 15 equal equals 0, return fizz buzz. OK, it passed. Now I'm still not satisfied. Because the, the statement says multiple of 3 and 5. So I prefer to do it this way. Uh, where is my end? Here. Uh, because like that, when the developer reads the code, you can say, OK, multiple of 3 and multiple of 5. So it's clear as well to understand. It still pass. Now again, I'm going to refactor my code, my test. So I'm going to group these two together for a multiple of 3 and 5. Uh, oh. <laughs> so should I type this buzz when multiple of 3 and 5 given? I'm going to run my test. And everything is green. Um, now if I continue, I cannot think about any uh, test that will fail my, uh, my code. So I decide that I don't have any refactor to do. I could do a bit more. I can extract variable. Uh, I can do a name variable. I can create sub functions. But I think for the purpose of the demo now, I think I'm good enough. I'm happy with that. So I can push and commit my code. Now, if you look at the result of the test here, uh, uh, can I zoom in? No. I don't know if everybody can see that. It's a bit small, right? Uh, so just to explain, what I mean by just by reading the test, you can tell what the code is doing. If you just read that, you, can, you, can, you know what the code is doing. So she written the input number with not multiple of 3 and 5 given. She written fizz when multiple of 3 given. She written buzz when multiple of 5 given. She written fizz buzz when multiple of 3 and 5 given. So just by reading this, you know what this is doing without reading the code. And this can be understood by everybody, not only developers.
So this is a big advantage of TDD and writing proper tests as well. Uh, okay, I'm good for the demo. So let's go back to the slide. So how is this useful? So it helps to understand the problem statement. As I said, rather than coding directly the whole problem, it, you have to break it down to very small pieces. It looks tedious at the beginning, but once you get used to it, it brings a lot of advantages. And it helps you resolve more complex problems easier. It gives a better design because every line of code you write is because a test tells you to write it and not because you want to do it for any kind of reason. It helps, of course, define the current state of the system behavior and it gives you a full suite of tests to ensure system sanity. Meaning by having this, I have like 100% of light coverage, so I ensure that my, my code is tested, so nothing will break it, and I got a regression test as well with that. Okay, uh, now I don't know if you have any questions so far about the demo, something that was not clear. Otherwise, we move on to your part. So now it's your turn. I ask you to clone the following repo. So we added you uh, on the GitHub, so you should have access to this one. If you have any issue with that, uh, let us know. So as a reminder, there is Amul, Vidaba, uh, El Nathan, Anil, Kian, and myself that can help you with that. So once you check out the repo, please create your own branch with the following uh, naming. So TDD slash your name or username or you decide. Then you can open the code in your favorite IDE and run just npm install to have just and everything configured on your machine. Once this is done, I'll give you maybe, I'll say, two or three minutes should be enough. Uh, then I'll let you know to continue. Who's still more time to do the, those steps? Who is not finished yet? Raise your hand. Okay, one, two more minutes, okay?
We good? Yeah? Okay. So I continue. So just some guidelines for the exercise. Try to push every, I would say, five, ten minutes. And that we can see the result on the dashboard directly. Uh, we have a bell over there, so I'm just going to ring a bell as a reminder because sometimes when you lock into your code, you don't think about it. Uh, so the bell is for pushing your code. Uh, we have two comments for you. So npm run test to run the test in the terminal or the console. And npm run coverage will run the uh, test coverage in your, in your console. So you will see a nice table with a line, branch, and all the coverage possible there. Um, OK, so just before we start the exercise, reminder, so TDD, red, green, refactor. And if you look at the cycle during the demo, it's very fast. So each cycle is maybe one, two, two minutes. So I don't write code during 10 minutes, then write a test during five minutes. So it should be very fast. So try to break, to break it down to very small step. So this is the point of TDD, and this is what's difficult. OK? As Ken said, it's OK to struggle. We're here to help. So this is the exercise. Uh, forget about the timing. So the input, in this case, sentence. So she sells seashells by the seashore. It can be any sentence, not, not only this one. The output is uh, an object, or you decide what you want, or a string. We let you decide. That will count the words. It's case insensitive. So in this case, every word appears once, except C. That appears two times, and one with the uppercase. But as it's case insensitive, we count it as two. As I say, this is an example. Every sentence should be, should be, should be working. Uh, don't take into account uh, weird characters like comma, or, or like uh, exclamation mark, question mark, those kind of things. Just space and characters, OK? Any questions for that? So good luck. And we're going around and just raise your hand if you're stuck. Sorry? This one? A few of them are pending. That means we added them, but I think they haven't accepted the invitation. Oh, OK. Second thing is maybe the bell is there, so I don't know whether you told them every five minutes. Yes, I told them. So just uh, telling, so letter is telling me that some of you didn't accept the invitation uh, from the GitHub. So maybe check your email, and you have to accept it to be added to the group. During the exercise? Sorry. Can I turn it off during the exercise? Sure. Because now we're going around and 12 then. I hope you discussed well of all the feedbacks. Now if I can ask uh, one representative of each table can just share with the others uh, about your discussion. And if you have any questions, just please ask us and we try to answer them. Uh, can we have a mic? Uh, where is the mic? Where is the microphone? Sorry? Oh, so who wants to start? Please don't be shy.
Okay. So it was more about breaking down the problem in small parts that you had uh, difficulties, right? Okay. Yeah, to, to address this, this is, I would say, the most difficult in TDD is to be able to see the problem and breaking down in very incremental and small step. So that's all the magic, I would say, in TDD, what takes time to get. So it's all about practice. Yeah. Next one. Yes. So, uh, yeah. where, where do you find the balance? Okay, so uh, that's a tricky question, I would say, but there's some kind of rule that say that every time you have like a condition that repeat three times, or you can see three tests that fulfill the same condition, then it's the right time to group them together and have some logic. So that's one of the rules. Now, sometimes you can, get, you can take a bit shortcuts, I would say, if you see it's logic and okay, that's obvious, then you can take shortcuts. But those are, I would say, the, the rules you can follow. You're welcome. Uh, next one. Yeah, that depends on how you approach it. It's about the small step you can take and the code. You only write the code when a test tells you to write it, basically. And there's no other choice and it doesn't make sense. If you have to refactor everything, that's fine. But as long as you have the, the previous test that say, okay, that was the state and it has to be like that. So, yeah. it yes? Yeah, so I add on. Uh, one thing I would like to say is. Take the mic. Uh, just to add on to what Kevin just said. I think one thing I would advise you is whenever you try to code, uh, validate your assumptions. So if you think the problem is as such, validate what you think is correct before you go to implement. That might help simplify your problem. For example, you spoke about commas, so you could uh, just check whether that is something which is necessary, and that might have sorted out the complexity that you face. They're going to demo later on the programming how to resolve this in TDD. So maybe you help you uh, show what the step they're taking. Yeah? So um, that's true that today uh, is very basic, I would say, with the small functions. 
in the real world, when you have production system, it's way more complex. But the idea is still to break, up, break down to very small functions that are testable. No matter what this function called an API, via HTTP, or any other uh, protocol, then you can mock this part. The idea is to isolate your function and to simulate what's around your function. So then the idea is still valid for TDD. As long as you mock and you simulate what's around, then your function should still be tested in a TDD way. TDD way. Uh, usually you mock. If you do with actual data, uh, you have to connect the HTTP and everything. This for me is more like an integration test. So you can still test uh, after a while, but the idea of mock is that you control uh, your, uh, your environment. It's not open to every kind of data that can come in. I don't know, did I answer your question? Oh. I mean, uh, yeah. If you notice the way you write the test and you write the implementation, the cycle is very fast. And at the end of the day, when you have enough tests to finish, you run out of tests, it runs very fast. So the question in this case is, since you have production data, if you're going to write a test, I, I don't think you test against production data, but if that's really the case, does it cause your test to run slower if you're really doing that? That would be the first consideration, I think. If, it's, if it runs slow, you should look for ways to make it fast. How one way is no mocking, you're right. The other way is you could have a mock API that really takes you to request and you take samples from production that gives you all the edge cases you care about. You put it in there. Then you put, you test against that interface. Of course, the top option is to use a mocking framework into your unit test itself. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of using mocking frameworks. I would tend to go for the second approach. But sometimes you really need a mocking framework. So don't lose sight of the fact that first of all, the TDD is supposed to help you to think through your design. Secondly, the test is run fast. If whatever approach you use to achieve this means and your test is not running fast, you need to rethink the strategy. Anybody else? No? Okay. So uh, I have a curious question. How many of you guys have one test and you have an implementation already. If you look at the unit test, there's only one test. No? Okay, how many of you guys have two tests? Three tests? That's one person, four tests? Five? Six? Seven? Okay, eight? No? More than nine? Remember the goal here is not to say you have more tests or less tests. The goal here is to give you the confidence when you write your code. That's the goal. So usually you differ between people. Some people may have been more, some people need less. At the end of the day, you as a developer who is using a TDD technique to write your code, you yourself need to feel comfortable with what you have. Because some of us may be a bit more scared, for example. What about this boundary case? What about this edge case? In order to give you confidence, you may want to write a test for that. But for some people, they may feel that actually I'm quite confident the code can handle it, so you will not add that additional test space. Right? So it varies and it comes with experience. Right? Uh, so all I can say is the longer you try it out, the more confident you are in taking small steps. Uh, that should help you to gauge where to stop. Okay? Okay, so now we're done with the TDD part. So I suggest we do a small break, about 10 minutes, and then we're going to start with the pair programming uh, part of the workshop. So don't forget, there's some snacks over there, drinks. Uh, so uh, see you in about 10 minutes. So what time is it now? It's 36. So at 45. See you at 45. We start. So the second part of this workshop is about pair programming. And uh, just do a quick sound check. The last table there, can you hear me? You can? Okay. Before I even dive into this topic, let me just uh, say one thing to those who have voted the part where you say, I've done it and I hate it. All right. Uh, this session is not to convince you to love it, but rather it's really to ask you questions about have you considered 
certain aspects of pair programming when you were doing it? Were those things present? Maybe because those things are not present, that's why it makes you uncomfortable. Maybe it's because of those. So try to consider, put that into a part of uh, things that you want to think about, all right? Okay, I'm going to start with Ken Beck. As you guys probably know, when it comes to pair programming, when it comes to test-driven development, these are all extreme programming. Uh, they all come from extreme programming. And so this is another uh, quote. He said this thing, uh, if code reviews are good, if code reviews are good, we will review code all the time. And the, the thinking behind that is this. If, if certain things are good, why are we not doing it all the time? One example is, if testing is good, why are we not testing all the time? That is why I introduced test-driven development, test all the time. So now when it comes to the topic of pair programming, if code review is good, why are we not reviewing all the time? And that's where this practice comes from. Now, um, I don't know how many of you guys, every day when you wake up, you go to work, you, you look forward to review other people's code. You look forward to approve a pull request. How many of you guys enjoy doing that? Okay, very nice. Uh, for the rest of us mortals, uh, we probably don't like. And sometimes the problem is this. Somebody writes some code, you have no clue what's the context, and you just got a pull request, you look at the code, and the best you can do at that point in time is what do you do? Syntax check. How much value is that? And if you're in a hurry, you check the syntax, nothing seems to be serious. Uh, all those now cases are handled, so you just accept that. But the thing about pair programming is it allows you to do code review on the fly, and I'm going to explain it a bit more later. Now, this is what pair programming is and what pair programming is not. I hope this session is just to clarify for you guys. Um, I know there's quite a fair bit of misconception. Let's start with the left side, the white one. Uh, first of all, pair programming is not paying two persons to do the same thing. When a manager or when someone outside will look at two programmers sitting together doing something, you may assume that they are doing that. But in reality, when it comes to programming, the fact that you type right is actually not what you do most of the time. It's thinking through logic, trying to figure things out. That is what you do most of the time. So pair programming is not paying two persons sitting on a keyboard just typing. It's not. It's about, on the right side, it's about investing in better software quality and design. I do notice even earlier on when we do a TDD, uh, some of you guys already are collaborating, talking to each other already. Now, when you face such a simple problem in this workshop and you're able to collaborate, what more when it comes to writing production code? Why shouldn't we collaborate in that manner? Second, uh, some people would think pair programming is only good for training. In other words, oh, a newbie just joined our company, let's pair. And once a newbie can fly, leave him, uh, leave him and let him do all his own stuff. But pair programming is also about complementing each other's strength and, and knowledge. Like today, you may be working on this part of the system, the other person, another part. Then the next day, when both of you come together, you have knowledge about your entire system even more because two persons are working together. You complement each other. Some people think that pair programming works well only for a small number of people. Um, that may be something that instinctively we may think so, especially those of us who haven't paired before. You may think that, well, I don't like to, someone to be looking over my shoulder. But those who have tried pair programming, surprisingly, it works well for majority of people. I'm not saying for everyone, for majority. I've seen some cases where it's just, um, it's just not possible to pair program well with the person. Okay? But it works well for majority. I hope today over here is the majority part. Pair programming is just, it's not just code and syntax review by the partner. So you have two persons sitting, one person typing the stuff, the other person on the left just look at all the syntax and correcting all the syntax. Uh, if you did pair programming in the past, and that is what you do, just do syntax check, I, I, I'm calling that suffering in silence because it's very boring. Just sit there and syntax check. But rather pair programming is a context-rich review and collaborative design activity. 
which also means that when someone chooses to write code in a certain way, since you are around, you have the context on why that thing is being done that way. And if you feel otherwise, immediately you are able to comment because you have a context. Unlike when you do a pull request, you just review someone's code, you may not have all the context. So this is why pair grammar is also quite effective in a sense. It gives you context-rich review. The last two things is uh, you have to pair for everything. Some people feel that, wow, my team is doing pair programming. I, I don't like it because the moment I step in the office, I must be pairing with someone else until the moment I leave the office. Uh, or even cases like, I just want to try out a certain things. I want to play with certain technology. Wow, you mean I must pair with someone to do that? Uh, no. Usually the recommendation is minimally you should pair on production code. In other words, the code that you write, they will end up being in production systems. You should at least minimally pair on that. And the last thing is uh, no more individual time. It's similar to what I've just said. The moment you step to the office, you must start pairing already. So even when I check my emails, reply, re reply to other people, I must pair, is it? Uh, it doesn't mean that. You can consider this thing called call pairing hours. Your team can agree to say that when we do pairing of production code, we can start pairing from, let's say, 10 a.m. to 12, then take a lunch break, then maybe 3 to 5. The rest of the time, you can do the rest of the things that you need to do. Okay? I'm quite sure none of us here have this luxury of uh, going to the office and just start coding, right? There's always meetings and all these other things. But if you have a core pairing hours, you could focus on writing the code. The rest of the time, you can do the other things that's required of you. Okay? Terminology. I think it's important to clarify the terminology because going forward, I'm going to keep using these words. What is a driver? A driver in pair programming is a person who's typing on the keyboard or holding onto the mouse. That is a driver. Okay? You are the one who types. The person sitting next to you, in the past, is called partner. That's your partner. It's nothing wrong to call a partner. But I've also noticed that the terminology navigator comes out in play. A navigator is someone who sits next to you and pair with you, yet at the same time try to think about what are the scenarios that you may need to cover, you need to handle in your code. Okay, so the partner or the navigator works with the driver together. Uh, I'll be using these terms interchangeably as we go along. Right, um, so at this point we're going to do a pair programming demo. In fact, I'm actually quite happy that most of you are still around because some people say, pair programming, I don't want, I leave already. But at least you can try it out, okay? Uh, for the demo, before I demo that, I need you to find someone to pair with because you're going to try that out as well. First, introduce your name and what is your favorite programming language? Find a partner first, all right? I'll give you one minute, shouldn't be hard to find. Huh? Okay, start looking for a partner. For those who don't have a partner, uh, we have people who's ready to pair with you. Uh, Al Naden, Anil, Amu, he won't be available yet. Okay, now the next thing is, the next thing is, between the two of you, decide whose laptop will be used. Okay, decide whose laptop will be used because you'll be only using one laptop. As a pair, you're using only one laptop. Okay? Uh, we're going to move on now. Right. Um, the reason why I ask you guys to pair up now is because later on when you actually do the pairing to write a program, you have to watch out for this thing. And this is my guide. A hitchhiker's guide on how not to pair program. Not to pair program, okay? And in order to demonstrate this, I invite my Oscar-winning actors, uh, Amul and Kevin. What they're going to do is, they would show you a scenario. You have to observe the scenario. After that, you tell me which one from 1 to 5, 
which one of it that they are doing. Okay? What is the dysfunction that they are showing over there? Clear? So I'm going to ask them to start first, all right? Okay. Okay, stop. All right. Uh, which one is it? Second one. Quiet Quincy and disengage then. Which one is the quiet Quincy and which one is disengage then? Huh? That one is disengaged. Yeah. You mean Amu is quiet? Okay, yeah. Uh, what's happening is Kevin wasn't talking very much when he called. And Amu did try to engage, but in the end, he gave up. That's why he pulled out his handphone and started surfing. Uh, okay, before I even comment on that, let's go on to the second scenario, okay? Right. Okay, guys, ready? Uh, I wanted to hear if you think we should uh, extract the value. Wait a second, Ken. Yeah. No, but uh, I think that the test that we broke is wrong. I think, uh, I think I know what I'm doing. I've done this before. I think it's the right way to do it. But I thought a different way. I think we should consider it, no? Yeah, this one is finish. I think I'm right here. Okay, stop. Which one is it? Five. Sorry, someone say hogging. Sorry? Huh? Five? Hasty Hansen? Uh, no, that's not. One. Righteous Ron. Uh, is it right? Yes. Yeah. Um, righteous Ron tends to be the kind of person when you quote, you always think you're the only one who knows the answer. Uh, it can happen, but in pair programming, you have to be open to listen to other suggestions. And that's from a perspective of the driver, the person who types. Now, sometimes it's the person, the navigator who thinks, or the partner who thinks he or she is the right one. No, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, right? Pair programming is a collaborative work, so both sides need to learn to collaborate in that sense. Okay, ready for the scenario? Okay, I will hear uh, the test of the child function. Uh, so I think the liable name uh, should be the code. Okay, stop. What is this? What is for? Dirty Harry. Uh, is it right? Yes. Okay, not a segment. I think in terms of our own way, our tidiness or how clean, uh, that impacts pair programming a lot. I used to pair with uh, an ex-colleague in the past. Before it starts pairing, you always take an alcohol wipe to wipe the keyboard and to wipe the mouse. Then only we start pairing. I was laughing at him and saying, why are you doing all these things? We are clean. Then he tries to prove to me that it's not clean. How? By taking a keyboard, flipping it upside down, patting, and all the crumbs that falls in your keyboard comes out. Now, and sometimes, dirty hairy can occur where you eat oily food, right? Now, pair programming doesn't mean you cannot eat food while someone code, right? Then when your hands are oily, you start to grab the keyboard and start typing. Then you give back to your partner. These kind of things, hygiene, uh, we have to watch out for. Right. Okay, next one. Okay, can you explain what you're doing here? Yeah, uh, just give me a minute. Uh, I don't think we should do something differently. Wait okay. a second, can I, can I just... <laughs> I can just <laughs> okay, stop, stop. Uh, that's a bit overacting, but okay. What, what is it? What is it? Three or five? It's actually, which one is it? It's Hogging Henry. Hogging Henry. Um, yeah, when we get in, we have this thing called the flow, right, as developers, we get into the flow. And sometimes we get into the flow, we just don't want people to disturb. Uh, what would be helpful in that case is to have a certain common understanding before you start. 
so that if you're in a, in, a, in a flow, let your partner to do it. Or if you feel not comfortable, at least talk about it beforehand, all right? Uh, one, last, one last thing, uh, no, no price for guessing then. So Okay, stop. Uh, that is Hasty Hansen. Yes. Yeah. Now, there's one thing in, in psychology, in programming psychology, is you need to understand the person who's typing will not always be the fastest to spot things. The person who's watching usually spots things faster. For example, if you're typing and you try to uh, click on the menu, file open. Let's say, let's say, let's take the example. Your pair will catch where the menu is faster than you do. Sometimes you just couldn't see it. That's just psychology. It goes with this thing. If you write a code, you open your bracket, close your bracket, and you miss it, usually your pair will spot faster. Now, when it comes to pairing, you have to be patient. Let the driver take his or her time to finish what is finished until you realize he, he or she really forgot. Then you're going to make a note of that. Or if you see a driver is struggling, why the code doesn't compile, and you know that it's because of a syntax error, then you can point it out. Okay, so these are the five dysfunctions on how not to program. Yep, thanks guys. Wow, deserves a clap. Ah. Okay, ah. So from, from that end, I'd like to move now into how then should I approach pair programming? Uh, this is what I would use, golden rule to pair programming. It's simply this, do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Like treat others like how you want them to treat you. And this is not a very difficult skill. Some people call it kindergarten skills. Since young, we are taught to do that. So some suggestions. Um, this is an incomplete guide. Okay, this is an incomplete guide because uh, it doesn't, your, you may have your own ways. First one is, use we when expressing something that may not be favorable. You may be coding, and you find your pair is coding towards a wrong direction. When it's going through a wrong direction, you don't start to say something like, hey, that's a stupid way of going, you're going a wrong way. Rather than that, say, I think we are going the wrong way. That brings in the team spirit. It's just a simple phrasing, but it does help. Second point, use I when they're going that stuff for you. Your pair may be typing something and you couldn't follow. So what you would want to do is say, I'm sorry, I cannot follow what you're doing. Can you explain to me? The third one is the navigator can offer to drive when the driver is stuck or when unable to express an idea verbally. So you may be pairing a partner and he's type, he or she is typing. Halfway through, you realize he or she is stuck, but you have an idea. Why not offer to take over the keyboard and just say, uh, let me show you what I have in mind. Or you might want to check, are you stuck? Can I help? So you just take over and start typing. That's how you swap pairs, uh, sorry, swap the roles within the pair really quickly, okay? Now point four is uh, drivers. Consider vocalizing your thoughts whenever possible. Uh, remember just now, there was one point where Kevin is showing, he's just typing, but he's not saying anything. I don't know how many of us here have the gift of the ability to read minds. No. Now, because of that, we don't have that gift. We need to help our pair to know where we are going. So if you try to think about vocalizing what you're doing and what you're thinking. For men, uh, typically, it can get a bit difficult because we cannot multitask. Uh, it takes time to train yourself to do that. I remember if you, if you read the book, Pragmatic Programmer, anyone who read that before? Pragmatic Programmer? The, okay, yeah. So there's this part where they talk about rubber ducking. Rubber ducking is a technique where if you're stuck, imagine you are writing your code and you're speaking to a rubber duck. Just vocalize what you're doing. That sometimes helps you to get unstuck. And when you're vocalizing with your pair, that can be helpful as well, right? Um, so later on, when you try the pair programming, try this, consider vocalizing your thoughts and see how it feels if you're not used to that. 
Point number five, give permissions explicitly and upfront, especially if you're pairing with someone new. I notice among us, there are some of us are people who know each other, so that can be easy. But if you're pairing with someone new, that person may not know how you work and you don't know how the person works. You can consider telling upfront what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with. I remember when I first paired, I was telling my partner, stop me if I'm too fast. Well, I was full of uh, ego. I thought I could type very fast that my partner cannot follow. But most of the time, he told me you're too slow. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> but it's things like this that's helpful, you know. At least you know, you give your partner permission. If you see me being stuck, can you just jump in? Feel free to just jump in. That will set up a good context for you to start pair programming. Uh, point number six, navigators, watch your driver's back by tracking reminding things. Now, this is really useful, especially when you do test-driven development. Your partner is thinking about test case, uh, writing the code, and when you may realize, what about this edge case that you need to handle? Now, instead of disturbing the driver at the point in time to say, so, so, I have something to discuss with you, and your driver is in the flow, you just jot down that, that part, the, the thing that you need, if you feel that needs to be addressed. And when the driver has reached a logical point, just talk to the driver, I think we need to handle this special scenario. That's, that's one sort of things that I find it very helpful in the past when I pair with uh, someone else. Point seven, navigators, be patient. And this, re this comes to Hasty Hansen, right? Uh, the, the person who's typing may not always be the fastest. The next one is lose the ego and put on humility. This is especially true if you're not used to pair programming or your parent is someone you're not familiar with. All of us fear that we are being judged, right? Wow, this person looking through my, my shoulder, I wonder if it, I'm good enough. We always fear that. But if you always have that thinking in mind, it's going to be very hard to pair. You have to learn to let, let go of your ego and put on humility. All of us make mistakes, so it's okay to, to, to make mistakes. Uh, last two things. First, take care of your personal hygiene. Uh, dirty Harry, so not going to comment more. And point number 10 is swap pass often at logical stopping point. One of the reasons why we do pair programming is because of knowledge spreading. You work on a module, we pair with someone else, that person will also get the knowledge. Uh, how many of you guys here do Scrum? Okay, everybody do Scrum. I assume your sprint length is about two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Okay, the four weeks is the maximum right there. If more than that, you're not, you not doing Scrum. Uh, if you pair together and you work through the entire sprint, you kind of lose the benefit of pair programming because you're not sharing knowledge uh, enough within the sprint. You're creating a silo within the pair for a sprint. So when you come to pair programming, usually you want to split pairs within the sprint itself. Okay? It's better if you... There are options for doing that. You can split at the point after you do a check-in. You split with someone else. Or you can finish a story, for example, then you swap pairs. Uh, I think this is one of the most common problems. People like to pair with each other so much that they don't want to swap. Uh, you, must, you must actually do that swapping. Now, when it comes to two persons sitting together, when you look at a person that you've just decided to pair with, how do you do the pairing? Early on, I was just talking about attitudes and behaviours. Now the mechanics, there are generally three options. I know there are variations, but I'll just highlight three. The first one is time box. Time box means when two persons come together, one person would be writing the test and writing the code for X amount of minutes. When the time finish, you swap the role so that the, the partner now becomes the one who drives, whereas the other one will just be the partner. That's time box. It's up to you to figure out what works for you in terms of time box. Some people try the Pomodoro technique. There are variations to that. The second one is called fluid. Fluid is when two persons work together, you can just swap at any point in time. For example, if you're stuck, the other person just take over and continue. Or if you feel that you have a better idea, you just take over and continue and just keep swapping. There's no definite time to swap, but it's fluid. Third one is the ping pong technique, where one person will write a test case, then you pass over to your partner to write the code. That means your partner becomes a driver now, to the code to pass a test case. And this works well if you do TDD. You write a test, then your partner write the code, then make sure it passes before you swap the role. 
later on, I'll demo with you. I'll demo for you the ping pong method when I pair with Amu. And the last one is really variations of the above. You can always change. And if between different partners, some would prefer different things. Try it for yourself. What works? So when I'm sitting with Amu later, to avoid this demo as a spectator spot, I want you to notice something because there are some things that in our interaction that you need to pick up. And we'll do a debrief after that. What is it that you pick up, okay? So what do you notice or pick up from this demo? Right? So I want to... Uh, no, not this one. So I'm just going to do a demo now. I invite Amu, come sit with me. This one. Say hello to me. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to adjust the mic a bit. Okay, you guys, can you hear me? Uh, can you at least see our face? If not, then we may need to turn on the lights. They can't see the screen. <laughs> they can't see the screen. Okay. Good. All right. So good. So can you can you see this? Yes. It's yeah, okay. It's You're comfortable with the space. Okay. So we are going to use ping pong for the pairing session. Yeah, I, I okay. suggest that. Are you okay? Yes, I'm good. Okay. Uh, anytime, if you feel uh, if you want to take over the machine, feel free to. Yeah. Okay. So let me just uh, give you a debrief. Uh, yesterday, Kevin and myself, we are pairing on this uh, word counting exercise. Yep. So we are writing tests and uh, I got some test cases passing for the simplest case, for example, a single word. Uh, but then six o'clock came and we just decided to go home. So I just sort of pick it up from here today and since you're available, okay, yeah, sure. pair with me. Let's do it. Okay. So since we're doing ping pong, uh, I start. I start okay. writing tests. Okay, uh, so... Ken, could I interrupt you? Uh, yeah. What is the current state of the test cases that we have? Are they all passing? Oh yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, let's see if we're on a stable ground. So let's just run a test. Oh, okay. So one of the tests is failing. Um, right, so we're missing some implementation probably. Yeah, so this is a case where I have two, a sentence we repeated twice, a word, word, I'm supposed to get a two. Yeah, that's where I failed the <coughs> test case yesterday where I went home. Um, okay. Are you comfortable to try now, or you want me to write? Sure, uh, I'll go over to the code file. Yeah. Okay, so we're basically missing the scenario where we need to have two words. Um, a possible solution that I can think of is, I would like to, since we're doing it the TDD way, yeah. maybe I can implement this, fake it till you make it. So I'll probably select, uh, I'll check the sentence. Okay. To be equal to word word. Okay. And if that is the case, I shall return. The frequency for word. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, let's see if the test case pass. Okay. Ah, okay, that's cool. nice. Shall I introduce the third yes, test case? Sure. Um, so now that we have this two words working, I'm thinking of introducing a different word. That should help us to take a case where our expected result can have more than, more than one uh, word count. Okay. Let, okay. let me show you what I have in mind. Yeah. So what I was thinking of is just do a sentence with, with different word and a word repeated twice. Okay. In that case, it should return a count of three and count of one for the non-repeated word. Is that okay? Does uh, it? Okay, yeah, I'll wait for you to write the sentence maybe. Yeah, okay. 
So let me just add one more, maybe call another word. Okay. Okay, Kian, uh, I think we would probably be expecting the count of two instead of count of three. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That looks more reasonable. Uh, so, in the, so in case of this expectation, I would want to have another and one. Does that look good? Yeah, sounds good. So, let's run a test. Let me run all the tests first, make sure we are still okay with that. Nice, alright. Is it failing based on what I expect? Yeah, so uh, it's yeah. expecting two words, but yep. We only have a single word. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I think so. Now what we need to check is that because we have different words, uh, I could fake it, but the solution is kind of obvious in this way. So I would, I would rather want to break down the sentence into different mm -hmm. words. Okay. And send out the frequencies from there. So loop, loop through the array of words that I receive. Um, um, okay. Passing the frequency. But I think it will be some sort of refactoring. So actually I'm not comfortable running this test yet. Could I uh, uncomment this? Yeah, Take the code ahead. change and come back to it? Yeah. So I've got to comment this out. And what I'm trying to do here is I find out what I have in my sentence. You will want to split your sentence, right? Yes, sorry. So sentence, yep, all right. So I'll split it with the space. Yeah. So I have the words and then I will go through each word. Yep. And now I want to check whether this word is present inside. No, it should be an accumulator of some sort, a collector. Right. Yeah. Let's define it. Yeah, we need something to collect. As an object, is that fine? Yeah, that's fine. Does the uh, word accumulator make sense? Or would you prefer something else? Yeah, it makes sense to me, accumulator. Okay. So, so. so we this accumulator will basically store the frequency of each different kind of word. Yeah. So now what I'm trying to check is... Sorry, I'll just clean this up. If... Uh, the word is already present. It has to be present it's in. Line, the sorry, sentence. here. On line five, uh, yeah. the keys, it shouldn't be sentence, right? It should be accumulator. Right, you're right. Yeah. So if I find that object, yeah. what I want to do is uh, increment the frequency for that specific object. Yeah. So accumulator word plus plus. Okay. And if not, I wish to initialize it. Is that correct? Uh, I don't think it's correct, but you can run a test case and see how it looks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, oh, what is that? Yeah. Because this is to be a function. Ah, I see, right. So word should be equal, equal to... <coughs> ah, let me rename it. Yeah, it's not clear. So it's clearer, it's because we're looking at keys, yeah. so let's call this key. Yep. So I expect the word to be equal, equal to the key. Okay. Ah, all right. 
test pass. Okay, so let's uncomment our. Do you want to refract that first? Because uh, I felt that the code just now, especially line 14, the sentence word word, I don't think we need that. Oh, right, actually. It could be the cause of it passing. <laughs> yeah, I should have removed yeah. this. Let's return, Thanks for pointing out, return accumulator. Right, so that's the final result that we have. Yep. Oh, oh, all right. It fails. Yeah. I think because the accumulator is expecting... wrong. Sorry, what is wrong? So let me show you. So what I'm thinking of is, I'm wondering it's because of the plus plus. Let's try this. Nope. Fails again. I think what we're expecting is uh, there's probably an issue with the result that we have. Actually, this should not be zero, right? Oh, yeah, it should be one. You're <clears> right. It should be one because uh, when the object doesn't isn't present, but you're already iterating through it, so. I think the plus plus should be fine too. Yeah, but uh, I can yeah let's, let's do that. Let's do plus plus, yeah. Hope it passes. <coughs> oh, sweet. Okay. All right. Nice. So, what's that? Yep. Let's add comment our code now. Yeah, let's try that. Oh, pass. Is it the real full set? <laughs> Looks like it. Okay. Yeah, alright. Do you think it's time to check in? Looks like we have reached a logical point. Yeah, sure. I think I'm good with it. I wouldn't want to refactor this at this point in time. Okay. Cook, uh, do you think, Ian, we need to have another test case? Or is that sufficient coverage for now? I think it's fine for now. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Let's take a break. Awesome. Okay, um, so what do you guys observe? What happened? Oh, all sleep already. The code is so boring, they slept. Okay, sorry, let me change the mic because this is too much feedback. Well, while I change the mic, can you guys start thinking? What, what do you notice about my interaction with Abu or his interaction with me? Yeah, okay. Um, Abu asked me a lot of questions like, uh, shall we do this? Are you okay to do this? Um, so that is his style. When I pair with someone else, it could be different. But yes, that, that's a useful thing to, to ask sometimes, just to check. What else do you notice? Uh, I'm, I can I get you. Sorry. When you, when you notice a mistake, you didn't say it straight away all the time. You made, you made sure you waited, you waited until he was like finished doing what he was doing. Yeah, uh, that, that is a good point because sometimes we jump too fast to someone's mistake because the person, especially the, the driver, you, he or she may realize it by him or herself later. So don't, don't need to jump so fast. Uh, what is this agreement that we started with? When we come together, what was the agreement that we, we talked about? Yeah, so, so we agree on how we're going to approach the pairing session. Okay. Um, anything else you want to raise that I miss? Uh, 
in our pairing? No, I think no? So we're good? Sufficient. Yeah, so we actually check with each other on whether we are done with the test. And this is the advantage of pairing as compared to doing TDD alone. When you do TDD, you don't know whether it's time to stop or not. But when you are paired with you, both of you feels that you, it's a good time to pair, then that's, that's a really good feedback to get. It's a good feedback to know when to stop. And he also asked me about the renaming of a variable. Should it be an accumulator? When we pair, uh, sorry, when we work alone, sometimes we come up with some variables that we think is clear to the whole world. Uh, sometimes it's not. Having a pair with you to check that, if it's clear for two persons, chances are it'll be clear for some other people as well. These are all the advantages that comes as you work together on that. Okay, so this, uh, that's about a debrief for the demo, unless you have any other questions that you want to raise. Yeah. Your uh, mic. Uh, I have a point to ask. Basically, uh, I think uh, when I reached out to Kian to know whether we have three factored enough, if I was just working on my own, I might have gone into a multiple uh, iteration of refactoring my test case, my code, and I might have wasted a lot of unnecessary time, or might have added extra code. But because I had somebody uh, who's helping me review as well, so we kind of concluded together that that much of refactoring is sufficient. It saves time eventually, prevents unnecessary refactoring. Yeah, uh, so pair programming is not silver bullet, neither is TDD. It doesn't mean when someone pair, you get super results. But if two persons pair, you probably get better results than one person working alone. That's what we are saying. Now, if both of us are total newbies to JavaScript, we don't know much about it, probably the quality of output would not be as, as well, as, as good as it can be. But that's okay, because at least it's better than one of us working alone. Like, for example, he may be struggling with putting the function into the find. He may be doing so many things that, that takes up time just to find out. Whereas I can provide the information and say, this is a part where we miss out. Okay? Now, we are coming back to the pair programming exercise. Uh, I hope you have your pair ready. And the first thing I need you to do, you can use the same code that you used earlier for TDD, or you can pull from the same code base again. Except for this time round, you do not need to check in your code. Right? You do not need to push your code. Um, with your pair, first decide which uh, approach you want to do, ping pong, time box, or fluid approach. Decide on that. Then secondly, after that, you'll be working on an exercise. Make sure you use the TDD approach for that. And what exercise is this? It's called the 99 bottles of beer. Who knows this song? All right. You guys can sing? Because I don't know how to sing it. Uh, the way we are going to do this exercise is unite, you need to write a program and this program, when run, is going to output these lyrics. These are actually a set of lyrics. Um, the song starts with the top. It says, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. 99 bottles of beer. Take one down, pass it around. 98 bottles of beer on the wall. And the, and the lyrics continue by reducing by one. Okay? One bottle of beer reduced. Second one is 98. When you see all the three points here, the dot, 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 it simply means it, it decrements from 98, 97, 96, so on and so forth, until two bottles of beer. All right? Until two bottles of beer. And when it comes to two bottles of beer, you have to notice some things start to change. The word bottle is singular now as compared to everything be before it, plural. And when it comes to one bottle of beer, now this word becomes singular. The, the one on top is plural, and this change, and this part change as well. Of course, you have the last one, which is no more, which changes to no more. This whole sentence change, and this becomes plural again. Clear? Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to write a code that dumps all this text out. You can choose to hard code all the way from 99 to no more, uh, but I don't think your pair will allow you to do that. All right. So let's do the pair pairing right now. Try to do pairing and also try to do TDD style for this. I'll give you 15 minutes to do that. I'll do a time check with you later. Okay. There's no need to push your code into uh, Git anymore. 15 minutes.
Let's uh, let's stop here. Okay, let's stop here. Question: How many of you guys are relieved that the pairing session is over? <laughs> okay, laughing means you're relieved. Huh? Uh, one one comment before we do the debrief. I noticed the way you guys do pairing. Some of you guys will have neck pain tomorrow or spine pain tomorrow because. You're in an awkward position. In fact, I think sometimes the driver doesn't know it. The driver is so comfortable, but the navigator is just trying to find a way to see. And for some of you guys, the drivers who are so kind, where you share your laptop, the navigator can see right, but the driver is awkward position. So this is one of the things that uh, we need to take note about when we do pair programming: is the setup of your of your lap of your laptop. Or your tables and all those things. Sometimes you don't like it it's because it just makes it awkward. Now there are some plugins for editors where you can have two laptops connected together. You can see the code, so you can sit comfortably in front of your own laptop, while the other person when you make changes, you can see it reflected. I think Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code has it. IntelliJ should have it as well. The other option is to have your laptop plugged into a common monitor. Then you have. Plug in an external keyboard to the laptop. So both persons, you have two sets of keyboard, two sets of mouse, but a common monitor. So these are things you need to think about when you do pairing. It's good to see you guys at least trying it out, but I don't think it's sustainable as per what it is. After maybe one two hours, you you'll be so tired. Now the other question I have is actually I'm getting a debrief now.、Um, mentally wise, do you find it taxing? Do you find it to be more tiring as compared to doing alone? How many of you guys feel it's more tiring when you do pairing?、Uh, okay,、uh, who finds it less tiring? Okay,、uh, so, so, just to be clear, it's a binary option: tiring or less tiring. For those who didn't answer, I don't know what is that.、Uh, but it's true. Pair programming can be tiring. That's why when you do pairing, it's always good to take a break. It's very tiring. But the, I remember the first time I do pairing, it was about a whole six hours straight. When I first joined the company, I do it. I was totally tired at the end of the day. All right.、Um, now it's your turn to tell me what are the, some of the challenges that you face when you try doing pairing just now, apart from the things that I mentioned. Okay.、Uh, Kevin has a mic, so maybe you can just share what are your challenges. Just just raise it. Okay, true.、Uh, what I did was actually creating a bit of havoc for you because you're not at a logical point when you split pair, so you have to rethink the context, and you're actually working on the same thing except that in a different way. That's why I was suggesting look for a logical point to split pair and not do what I did just now. The reason why I do it is because one to create a bit of chaos. Second, is for you guys to feel how does it feel like when you work with someone else. Okay, what other feedback do you have? Thank you very much. So, and that is a very common thing. In fact, once I paired with a guy whose keyboard has no no、um, no markings, it's all black. I don't I don't know how to code.、Um, so what you shared is true because I think as developers, when we code alone, we have our own customized way of doing it. We like a certain editors. In fact,、uh, 
uh, one, one thing, other thing is we like to code our own way, brackets, whether you start in a new line or not, the spacing, all these things will come in the picture. Now, pair programming in extreme programming context is a team effort, it's a team thing, which also means that instead of just between two developers agreeing, in fact, your whole team needs to agree what is your coding standard, what is your editor that you want to use, how it's supposed to be set up. Um, these are at least the, the minimal things that you, you need to have in order to be comfortable. The other way is I've seen, if I remember correctly, there's some plugins where both your machines can connect together, but you can keep your own customized way of, uh, of your editor. So whatever the other guy changed, right, uh, using the laptop, you will be able to see, yet you are not constrained by that. I haven't tried it myself, but I've seen it. I think it's not a bad idea to, to try that. Um, yeah, okay, I mentioned it. What, what, else, what else do you guys have to feedback for that on your pairing experience? How do you feel when you have to switch pair? Of course, if your pair isn't a good pair, you'll be happy lah, when you switch pair, right? But how do you feel when you have someone totally new coming? No reaction, okay. Okay, uh, I'm going I'm to skip that then. Uh, Male-female pairing, how do you guys feel? It's okay. These are things, these are real, real scenarios you will face. So let, let's talk about it. How does it feel? Do you, do you feel it's an issue or non-issue? Uh, I'm looking at you guys. I can see the females and males here. What do you guys feel? No issue, okay. Uh, that, that table there? Okay, uh, that, that table? Okay, in front of everybody, say no issue lah. Inside a lot of problem. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. Uh, that, that is a very common pro common question. Well, how how would it, how should we pair if it's a different gender? But it's not just within this room. There's no issue. There's a book called Pair Programming Illuminated, uh, Laurie Williams. Generally, throughout the studies of studying people doing pair programming, right, it's really not an issue. The only thing you want to be careful of is um, the space between two persons. Some are more comfortable together. Some may not be that comfortable. Just be aware of that. I think it happens between guys as well, right? You sometimes brush another guy's hand, you may feel... It, it happens, okay? Just be aware of these kind of things. What if two hands touch at the same time? Sometimes got electricity, sometimes don't have. But, but that, that, these are things we have to be aware of. Uh, maybe one more thing. Anything else? Any other feedback? For those who try different methods of pairing, of swapping, uh, time-based, fluid and I think you guys are doing time based and ping pong. How do you feel about different methods? I can say that ping pong was really fun. I mean uh, the time based one was really fun. <laughs> time based one was really fun. It, it took us out of the comfort zone because it comes like in the this moment we had to stop working on what we did and switch topics. So yeah. it was a fun exercise. <laughs> Not sure if it would be fun. Okay. Work. Question do you think you can would you think that method would be sustainable over time? Let's say you do this for eight hours the whole day by swapping. No? Okay, so you may want to be aware of the things that you try. It may not be sustainable. Just switch to some other way. Um, how, how long do you choose between you swap? Two minutes. Two minutes. Wow, okay. <laughs> you know this thing about pair programming very early on when XP started? Uh, usually people would swap um, around maybe 10 minutes. This is more extreme than extreme. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, fair enough. Uh, if it works for you, I, I think it's fine. So this is real debrief. So at this point, I think we have 15 minutes left. It's time to close. Um, thank you for participating. I, I'm quite sure. I hope you guys enjoy it. In fact, I noticed the level of uh, the bus level between the first time when you do TDD as compared to the second time. The second time seems to be more alive, more interesting. 
Uh, for those who didn't like pair programming, I hope today at least will give you some idea on how to make it better, to make it a more enjoyable experience for you. Um, just to recap, so you spent almost three and a half hours in this session, but if we don't know what's the benefit, why we're doing it, I think we kind of missed the point. So I'd like to come back here to talk about what's the benefit of doing test-driven development and pair programming at the same time. Uh, these are just four points. The first one is increased software design and quality. And the reason, if you do TDD, it helps you to think through your software, the, the code you're writing. Uh, of course, it's going to increase your quality because your test covers your code to make sure it works. And the consequences of that is you have lower defects. Second point, you have good knowledge spread. When it comes to pair programming, since most people swap, you have a good knowledge about the systems that's being built. Now, what about test-driven development? How does that help us with good knowledge spread? You're waiting for an answer. Uh, now, the way good knowledge spread is the test. Kevin raised that earlier. You look at the test, you know what is it doing. You know how the code is supposed to behave. That helps to spread the knowledge as well. If you're code based but no test, it's hard to get the knowledge because all the logic is, you have to spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. Now, because there's a good knowledge spread, you reduce single person dependency problems. The kind of problem where you work with a team, you work alone, and you want to go for a two weeks holiday in an island, and your team expects you to be on call because they may call you and ask you what the code is doing. Having doing TDD and pair programming, it's okay for someone not to be around because someone else would know uh, what has been done, okay? So that is uh, reduced single person dependency. The third one is it increases productivity overall. Uh, TDD generally will increase productivity. Pairing, it takes some time. Until both pairs, you get into a flow, into a state. You may find, sometimes find pairs argue over things, takes forever and never get resolved. They think this person thinks this design is good, the other person thinks his design is good. So how do you resolve those kind of problems? One way is usually bring it to the team and discuss with your team what you're thinking of. And it's actually a useful way to, to try to resolve issues. Now, because it increases productivity, the team would move faster. And the last point is it builds courage in teams. What do I mean by that? If you change a piece of code that doesn't have tests, uh, you'll be scared. If you're not scared, I salute you. Uh, personally, I'll be scared because I do not know if I break anything or not. But if I know this piece of code has a test coverage, by adding functionality and the test doesn't fail, it gives me courage. So that's how TDD helps. Um, the other thing about building courage when it comes to pair programming is a case where if you need to face a problem alone as compared to having someone to face it together with you, that should help you in having more courage to face it. I remember there was uh, many years back, uh, I was pairing with someone, checking the code, six o'clock, went home, so happy, midnight got a call, got production issue. So this shows uh, TDD and pair programming doesn't solve all your problems. But the fact that at the midnight, 12, 12 a.m., I have to go back to the office, I know my pair would go with me, and we stay until 4 a.m., that actually increases my courage in facing a midnight issue to be able to solve that. And because it builds courage in teams, it helps to improve the team morale. You, you finally feel that you're working as a team and can go forward together. All right? These are the few uh, points that I, I personally have felt after doing TDD and doing pair programming. Uh, anything that you want to clarify based on these points? Anything you want to get back to me on? Or you feel that maybe it wouldn't work? No? Yep. In my opinion, the last point is pretty tricky because the courage can be falsy because you have to trust that this test which was written was good and it really tests the functionality. So uh, I think you should check tests before you have the courage to say, okay, I can add functionalities, methods and so on and so on. Yes, um, I, I think Kevin didn't mention one thing is you can write 
a test that has 100% code coverage that, that doesn't test anything. I don't know if you guys have seen it before. If you don't believe, just uh, write a unit test, write a code, but don't assert anything in your unit test. You still get 100% coverage. Uh, that's not TDD, first of all. And yes, so in terms of whether you think the code will work or not, it really depends on how well you know the people around you. And if you pair with the person before, over time, that should improve in terms of how you feel about the quality that's being done. Okay? Um, is there anything you want to add on this last point? Well, I think you summarized quite well. Uh, as you mentioned, test as you put on the code. So it's not because you have tests that you have to rely on what you code and okay, everything is green. So tests are very good, so you have to review them as well and refactor them. Uh, another thing, maybe, that's not here. Uh, is that it's a team mindset. So at the beginning, it might be difficult, it might take more time, the rest of the team might drop, because you have to get used to it. With the whole team agree to that, on the long run, you will see a lot of benefits. So don't try to risk on your own in a silo, it will not bring anything. So try to this as a team. That's all I can add, guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I missed out on that. So it's useful. So, uh, before we, we leave, before we close, a couple of announcements. First of all, if you see the, this thing, these are meant for you. Uh, gifts, notebook, pen, and this one. Other than that, this thing called a Sharpie is not meant for you. Please don't take it with you. And these are not free as well, so don't take it with you. The other thing is when you leave, I, we would really appreciate your feedback about the session. And what this means is, you can write your feedback on the post-it notes. Uh, one feedback per post-it, whether it's good or bad, feel free to just whack. Uh, after you return it, when you leave the room, post it behind the, the flip chart there, if you see it, yeah, the one that Chris is uh, pointing to. That'll be useful for us to know how to improve the session. That's the first thing. Uh, second thing is when you leave, if you're interested to be notified uh, by Palo about any events or training events, feel free to drop your name card at the bowl behind at the table there, uh, next to the alcohol wipes. All right, Chris is bringing it up again. Okay, um, with that, I think we're done. Good, close enough. So thank you very much for your participation, and we are so. Oh, we are supposed to take we are supposed to take a group group photo. So. Everyone can stand up and come here, right? So everyone can stand up and come here. We're gonna take a little picture. Thank <laughs> you.